What's a light ask? Oh. Hey, that's a light ask. <laughs> a light ask? <laughs> that's something that can get you charged with human trafficking. <laughs> you know, somebody asks you for a favor and you don't think it's a big deal and then... Uh, it's a light ask. You're charged with human trafficking. I know. So this is something that... Uh, it's going to be a case study for this episode yeah, because it's, it's, it's kind of weird. Like, there are not too many human trafficking cases where, you know, your client kind of has clean hands or kind of clean hands and, and it's pretty defensible. Um, but this... Let's just say it this way. It all came out of our client doing a favor for somebody mm -hmm. and it went terribly wrong. Do you want to say Terribly it wrong. Right. So a friend says, hey, uh, I got this friend who needs a place to stay. Can you, uh, you know, get her a hotel room for the night? <laughs> says in court, it was a light ask. I've known this guy for a long time. The judge really liked that expression too. Well, actually, I didn't know what it was. And the judge said, no, 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 I know what it is. I go, I've never heard of it, but I like it. I'm going to use it. It's, it's like, a light ask. So yeah, he's just doing a, 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 what he thinks is a minor favor for a friend. And uh, and then ends up getting caught up. And, you know, a couple nights later, is like, you know, gets a phone call saying, oh, okay, I can find you another room. Next thing you know, he's charged with human trafficking as if he was pimping this girl out of a hotel room. So this is a real case. And, um, you know, many people who we're going to have a judgment on it coming up soon so we're not we want to be careful again not to identify anybody and not to um you know we don't know what the judgment's going to be but we think it'll be favorable to our client but it's an interesting case because it involves a number of factors one it's somebody who is would not normally be involved in this type of activity somebody with a very interesting background they were in finance had a had a car accident and then you know was sort of involved in other activities which were not which did not include pimping which did not include anything <laughs> remotely close to human trafficking and you know wind up associating with some person who may or may not have been you know the best of persons to be friends with and was asked to do a favor uh, for this friend allegedly that was coming in and then over the course of two days two and a half days of assisting basically extricated himself but all of a sudden got charged because another individual and this is really important a female who is who got involved with the female who is the complainant in the human trafficking case got arrested at the end of the day by the police as being a party to this offense as as engaging in human trafficking of the complainant and when came in for the interview realized she could get herself out of hot water if she just said a whole bunch of things and it was about really, other people <laughs> It was really interesting because the police had, you know, a name that they knew nothing about, which turned out to be our client and said, you know, things don't necessarily have to turn out a certain way for you if you tell us about someone. And then the person said, well, does this name fit? And and just started giving evidence, some of which absolutely was just not believable. And, and how does this whole allegation come about being made? Because this female who was charged the originally yeah no the the, the, the woman oh, yeah. who, who gave evidence against other people took the the complainant downtown toronto and dropped her off in the middle of nowhere and just took no off. resources and just took off on her yeah and yeah. so the complainant at that time in, in distress calls event well eventually does a few things in the city first <laughs> a few things. uh and um wasn't shopping at uh Aritzi or anything of that nature, um, but um, gets busy doing a few things, and once they sober up, decides to call police to try and get a ride home. To get a plane ticket home. Yeah, to get a plane ticket home. Um, but what A, what's really important is, so this female who gets arrested um, absolutely sees an exit plan, like yeah. laid out for her, and just gives all this evidence, some of which is totally fabricated, mm -hmm. and... Does well, not get charged. How do we know if totally fabricated? Because she's claiming to have met the complainant at a time period where everybody agrees the complainant wasn't even in the city. Including the complainant. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, so that that's one factor saying, no, I definitely met her at this time. And, you know, she was being trafficked by the client. And everybody agrees, other than her, <laughs> that this person was never in Toronto at that time and was not involved with our client at that time. Stuff like that. But what's so interesting about this case is that it started off with this one person arrested giving a multitude of information. What? 
I just remember a moment where she came up with an absolute provable lie and you, you like slammed your, your pet on the table and you just went, thank you. And it turned out you weren't on mute. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were doing this by Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? That was a real dumb one. Uh, I, I forgot what that it, was. It but. was another thing about her. Oh, I, I think uh, she was claiming like even a month earlier that she was aware that this person was being trafficked at the time she'd never met our guy. It was like, and there was something else that was said, but here's what's important. And I, I guess... We can set it up. So again, our client who came from super educated, was working in finance for a number of years, under 30, had a tragic accident as a pedestrian with a vehicle and was not able to return to work for a period of time. And then wound up getting involved basically in selling marijuana. Mm. And then is involved with a few people that yeah, you wouldn't normally want to be involved with, but nothing close to human trafficking. And because it's sort of beholden to this individual who gets a marijuana on credit, does this light ask and gets caught up and charged with multiple counts of human trafficking. What seemed like a light ask. What seemed like a light <laughs> ask. And really his role was met this person, picked them up, got them a hotel room at a nice hotel. Mm -hmm. And they're seen on surveillance going in. And he, he walks in, so they're on video. And he books the room, he goes, he books the room on his credit card. With his own real name. With his own identification. You know, taken under his points for that particular hotel. Got to make sure you get the points. Wants his points and leaves her there mm -hmm. and leaves. Yeah, no, there's no, there's absolutely, they looked at all the footage. There's no evidence that he went in or out of that hotel at any point. But they actually did not want to concede. The police did not want to concede that, of course, he couldn't have come back and forth, even though it's not on surveillance. But, but just take the facts for a second. Books a hotel room, leaves the person off, but books the hotel this, we're not talking about somebody who's brain dead, right? Under his own name, under his own identification, under his own credit card, with his address, on his points program. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then is not in contact with this person for the next day, which is pretty much agreed on the facts, then gets involved again with a call where this person is downtown. There's a whole, a whole other night goes by where he has no contact with her no whatsoever. No contact. Gets an emergency call from this person and sets her up at a hotel. Again, same type of hotel, nice high-ender hotel with his name his identification his credit card his address on his points program and then tries to check her out the next day as a favor to the friend and driver somewhere gets into an argument where this person wants because she's a little unstable and a little unstable wants some drugs and he says no i'm out of here because and, she threw a rock at his car and and allegedly he was the main player in all this mm -hmm. The, the and and is just jammed with these charges on human trafficking and we are not sure as to whether this young lady who came to toronto at the behest of another individual was here or was engaged in any um sex work save and except for the fact of the woman who was arrested originally was the only one who was trafficking her on the evidence or assisting her in obtaining sex or assisting work. her on it and was let go so our guy, um, he's saying, I got a rock thrown at my car and I'm just like, I'm out. And so there's evidence that he left town and was out of town for the, the rest of the time that this, this woman was in the city. And uh, and then there was also lots of evidence. Uh, through... But just explain that. So on the time that he leaves, it's, it's, it's agreed on evidence that he went to another city with his girlfriend and doesn't come back and doesn't have any other direct contact right. with the complainant. Uh, and then the uh, you know the the woman who was originally charged and then gave evidence against him, she agreed that the complainant was trying to call our guy and trying to get him on the phone unsuccessfully for a number of days, and yet he's still being accused of trafficking her. Even though the, the main problem that she had is he's not taking my phone calls. He's ghosting. <laughs> he's ghosting. And, and we're not saying that human trafficking isn't serious. Oh, Please, yes. we're not saying that at all. It's ex it's extremely serious and it's very highly damaging and traumatic. It's just one of these odd set of facts that we happen to have in this case where you get an, a bad combination of a few things. And, mm -hmm. and just to say this as well, there is no evidence in this case of financial, there's no financial evidence to support it. There really is no evidence to support that the person was actually meeting anybody other than on one occasion, which had nothing to do with our client. Mm -hmm. And then this, I guess why we're so interested in this is this, this what I call the rogue witness mm -hmm. was so willing to uh, throw our client under the bus with evidence that was not really provable in any way, shape, or form, some of which was obviously... Contradicted by all the other available evidence. And so not 
not truthful, um, to extricate herself from being charged and then said certain things, which was un uncannily, um, you know, odd. Like I had to take the money from her to give to this client, our client, mm -hmm. because he had directed me to do that when that was just palpably false. And then, and then says that within an hour or so, immediately gave the money back to the complainant so that drugs could be purchased. Yeah, so it's a really odd set of facts. It was like, well, are you collecting the money or are you not collecting the money? And, and one can argue, one can argue that, um, you know, our client maybe should have been a better humanitarian and should have noted early on that this person may have been a vulnerable individual, may have been somebody, if he's doing this light ask for, probably should have gotten her some help at the beginning but that's not a criminal act it's not if you're not a good humanitarian doesn't mean mm -hmm. you're a criminal doesn't mean you're involved um and nor should you be convicted of an offense on that basis but you know might have been you know should have been more alert to it but th here's the danger and and this is i think why you and i were so interested in bringing this up here is it, it's these co-accused evidence and let's talk about it now where we talk about what's known as a unsavory witness warning a vetrovic warning but you take a witness who was an accused who gives this statement against other individuals in particular our client is is not charged and then becomes a star witness for the prosecution and just how without skillful defense work could result in a conviction and somebody going away for six to seven years and we've we've seen this with jailhouse informants you know where you have to be very careful about you know somebody who's in custody and all of a sudden they're talking to their cellmate <laughs> And they say, yes, I killed the person. And then that, that's testimony. You know, it's just the same type of thing where you have, you know, somebody who has an interest and in how the Crown tried to establish that the person had no interest really in the litigation was not somebody who's unsavory and essentially should be believed almost on a JJRD basis, which we know is bullshit. But mm -hmm. talk about what it is, because I, I was very concerned that, it, that that in this case, like I've seen in other cases where it used to do you know, more homicides and other stuff, where you can take a cooperative witness, a cooperative accused who either flips or whatever and is now the main star for the prosecution and can easily be taken as reliable to ground a conviction. And what's the unsavory witness we call it a vetrovic warning in Canada? Explain it a little bit for the people who are viewing. All right, so uh, uh, is, is an indication that somebody has a bias or an interest, a self-interest, in giving a certain type of evidence against other people. Uh, in this case, there was, uh, the, the witness was told by police, things don't have to go this way after, after being told that she was being charged. You know, we understand that uh, people can get caught up in things and you know, this could, this could turn, out, turn out differently depending on uh, what it is you tell us. And the, the door was completely opened up for her to um, she was already aware of who the co-charged people were, so she knew it was ugly. I think you want evidence about these certain people. And then the story just grew and grew and grew as time went on. And so um, the Vetrovic warning is, is based on a case called Vetrovic, where they outlined certain indicators of a need to be wary and, and extremely cautious about motives and bias behind the, the reasons a person may testify in a certain way and give evidence against somebody else. And can include somebody who has committed prior criminal acts and by that very nature of criminal acts also is an unsavory or unreliable witness. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in this case, that person was involved in the purchase and sale of narcotics, uh, was involved at least on one occasion in trafficking of this individual, had been engaged in other illegal activity so on that basis can you can question the reliability and credibility of the witness and there was an interest in this case because the interest was very much focused on her ability to extricate herself from being charged and it took a while in cross-examination through much objection by the crown finally to get the complainant to say well yes i gave the statement to police but i see myself uh, testifying here as a natural extension of my obligation that i undertook when I gave my statement to police. So testifying at court was just the extension of that. Well, and let's look at the complainant too, because when the complainant gave her statement, uh, a more fulsome statement, because it was just a really brief one where there wasn't a lot of information. When she went back, she said, oh, my mom says that she'll buy me hair extensions if I give you a statement. <laughs> right. So, so the complainant herself 
had had all sorts of agendas involved in why she was cooperating with police at the time. One of which was, I didn't really want to be involved, but I, you know, a I needed a ride home, uh, you know, a flight home. Two, I was only willing to give this statement because I, my mom, I essentially bribed her to do things for me to make sure I had money or hair extensions or whatever. Mm -hmm. So again, that's an interest in in giving your evidence against somebody, and then that person itself had a criminal record whether you want to classify them as somebody who is vulnerable or not, but had a propensity for violence. So you have to take all that into consideration to then see, is there any corroborating evidence to support people who are that unreliable? But you can see just how dangerous this is. And in the past, we've seen incredible miscarriages of justice and incredible wrongful convictions based on um, evidence that's not reliable because of the unsavory nature of a witness. Mm -hmm. And this was like, you know, this was like calling back those other cases I used to do years ago where you have in high-end drug trafficking case, you know, we'd have a, a drug trafficker who's got a sweet deal and now is the main, you know, uh, witness for the prosecution. This was one of those cases which was so easy to slip through because human trafficking is such a prevalent issue now and so serious and there's so much sympathy for the complainant and anybody charged with that normally is really viewed quite despicably you know and so there is this almost enticing you know way to just let this slide through yeah. and you know we have a very very good judge who is very sensitive to these issues so we're, we're you know delighted about that but it's, it's not about that so much for me, this case. It's just how slim the evidence was and, and how somebody could have gotten caught up by just simply owing somebody a favor, doing this like ask, and then getting in trouble for it. And one could barely imagine that they would be that ridiculous to give all their information to make it just completely transparent who they are, mm -hmm. considering he came from It'd a be the Darwin Award. <laughs> yeah, really. And I, I was really struck by the... The, the, the submissions and the argument of the prosecution to rely on these witnesses in the face of obvious interest, obvious bias, obvious criminal history, and the absolute thinness of evidence. Like there was literally nothing else to corroborate. Mm -hmm. it, in my opinion, it was really... There it was, was a no, truly bizarre case. There was no show of, of financial transactions. There was no surveillance to support her allegations. The complainant said, yeah, like our client allegedly was taking her to various locations. There's, there's cameras everywhere around these hotels. Yeah. She it's had access to a hotel phone and, in fact, agreed that she phoned her mother almost every day. Made numerous phone calls. Yeah. In fact, on the first night that our client comes in contact... When she wasn't calling her mother. She was trying to call our client saying, come and take care of me. But he, he actually, this was an interesting fact, so when our client picks her up to take her to a hotel, he, he contacts the mother to say, hi, she's here, takes a photo with her, you know, to see in tower in the background, she's all smiling and gives his number essentially to her mother so that she knows that she's here. Like, it wasn't congruent. Do you know what I mean? There was no, it, it just wasn't congruent. But what I was so struck by, and I think we have to be very careful when we go forward with cases that are, you know, that on its face can be so horrific, you know, the, the... Um, hey, you'd think, how do you get charged with human trafficking unless you're doing something? Right, like it's, it can't it's, just be a light ask. It, it, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, and and it, you know, we we talk about this with sexual assault cases, we talk about this with domestic cases, but but this case was unique in the sense of of human trafficking because there was really so little supportive evidence, and frankly, evidence that was contrary to the theory of the crown, but there was this so enticing, you know, desire to accept the evidence of these two vulnerable women. The, the, the cooperator of justice, if I could call them, you know, and then the complainant, uh, where really you had to be very weary of their evidence because it was just not meshing with the reality of the evidence. Yeah, and it was a little bit concerning too because there was, you know, basically this person was, was doing crack cocaine and saying, oh, I no longer do it. And so there was a real sympathy and a concern that the stress of testifying might cause the person to relapse. And it's like, okay, yeah, whatever you're feeling for that is like, can we please focus on the liberty and the, the, the fair trial rights of our client? And, and, you know, you raise an interesting issue there because, you know, typically in these cases, the other thing that we happen to have to do this, this trial by Zoom, um, because it was set that way originally, but the complainant was testifying from another province. Yeah. And you will have in many cases where 
the crown is putting forward a witness who is vulnerable and or you know on the young side that uh, an application will be made for a person to testify by closed circuit TV. So for those who don't know, you can have this in sexual assault cases. So if it's a, a person 18 or under or of some vulnerability or having some professed difficulty or trauma in testifying, the Crown can bring an application, which is almost granted. Um, almost always granted. Almost always granted on its face that they can testify by a closed circuit TV. So that could be from somewhere in the courthouse or on some other location and frankly from other province. Um, and that's something real. And it's funny, we spoke about originally what it was to have a Zoom trial and how important it is to face your accuser. And we've had very good success with Zoom trials, but that's where everybody's on that basis. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're, we're back to the courts now and you're cross-examining somebody in front of you and there's that ability to immediately have that quick dynamic where everybody can see what's going on, um, that is easily removed now with these cases where we will see more often um, the desire by prosecution, not just in these human trafficking cases, to use closed circuit TV even for adult complainants. Yeah. Are you worried about that? I think that there's pros and cons. So, um, you know, sometimes sitting in the courtroom, especially when they have the plexiglass up all over the place, but um, not now. Depending, I mean, yeah, depending on, on the positioning of stuff, sometimes you can get a much better view of, of the of the complainant's demeanor and, and expressions and so on when you're when they're framed a little bit closer. On the other hand, quite often, you know, that, that kind of um, feed when it's a Zoom trial, especially, and they're not just from a, a witness uh, room in, in the courthouse, you, you know, it's too comfortable in a way. They're in their own bedroom. Uh, in this case, the complainant had uh, her cat jump up on her at one point, and it was... She was in her own bedroom. Just, yeah, the, the gravity of the situation, I think. Somebody came in, remember? Yeah. Her, Somebody came in to the house, yeah. you know, had to say, shh, close the door. Yeah. The cat jumped up. It's like, you know, I think it's an interesting thing to think about. You know, it's one thing to have somebody testify from a remote location where the solemnity and, and of the situation is imposed on them. You're in a special room in a courthouse or in a police station where you're testifying from versus your bedroom. Um, but I've been, people have said, so, you know, so what if they're testifying from home? Yeah. You know, we're, we're seeing these applications more. We had a trial that just got adjourned where the Crown was granted the application for the complainant to testify by closed circuit TV. We had to negotiate, or at least I negotiated where they would testify from. But I do think that when we're in the courtroom now, and I'm cross-examining through a TV set, literally in the courtroom, something's lost. Yeah. And I'm scared that this will become more of the norm. And even if there's a, a witness who's a vulnerable witness, and we'll leave it here, sometimes they will lie for some hair extensions. <laughs> Until next time. Like, subscribe, hit notifications, leave comments, <laughs> share. I think share, hair extensions are overrated. Thank you for viewing, everybody. <laughs> Have a good night.